Good evening and thank you for joining us for the Archaeology for the Future webinar presented in partnership with the Australian Archaeological Association. I'm Dr Ariana Lambridis, a coastal archaeologist based at James Cook University, and it's my pleasure to convene tonight's webinar. This is one of the fantastic events on offer for this week for National Archaeology Week, an annual celebration of Australian archaeology and archaeologists and an important opportunity to promote the importance of protecting Australia's unique archaeological heritage. Before introducing the panel topic and our panellists, I'd like to begin by acknowledging the Jabakai, Irukandji and, and Gimo Yindinji traditional owners of the Cairns region and their, um, and their cust custodianship of the lands in which I'm presenting from today. I pay my respects to all traditional owners and elders past and present, who continue cultural and spiritual connections to country. I also acknowledge the valuable and rich contribution that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples have and continue to make to Australian archaeology. With that said, my Zoom background this evening was taken during recent fieldwork on spectacular Jigaroo on Lizard Island in the northern Great Barrier Reef region. I've had the privilege over the past five years to work alongside many collaborators in partnership with the Dingal and the Garamuku traditional owners of the Lizard Island region to explore Indigenous marine resource use and coral reef interaction over on the Great Barrier Reef over millennia. This research uh, has been co-designed with our traditional owner partners and is aimed to fall around the region's deep Indigenous history and the importance of these connections to country for supporting its future outlook and management. So from my perspective, as a university researcher at least, this is an example of what archeology span for the future might look like. But enough from me, tonight we are lucky to have an esteemed panel of archeological scholars here to discuss this very topic, the future direction of Australian archeology. span Each have worked in diverse sectors across Australia and overseas, and together they're gonna to explore how and why we do archeology span now, how we might do archaeology in the future, as well as how we might actually enhance our practice. I, for one, am really looking forward to this stimulating discussion. So tonight we have joining us, firstly, Rob Williams. Rob belongs to the Wallagoo, Ngunnawal and Wiradjuri nation, uh, language nations of New South Wales and ACT, and is the founder of the consulting firm Warrumbidgee Archaeology and Heritage. Dr. Kelsey Lowe is a Senior Research Fellow at the University of Queensland and the Director of Kelsey M. Lowe, a heritage consultancy company. Dr. Carolyn Spry, Spry is a Senior Heritage Advisor and Archaeologist at Wurundjeri Woi uh, Wurrung Cultural Heritage Aboriginal Corporation and a Research Fellow in the Department of Archaeology and History at La Trobe University. And finally, Dr. Georgia Stannard is the Ex Education and Public Programs Manager for the National Trust of Australia and a research scholar at La Trobe University. So before I hand over to our marvellous panellists to introduce themselves and their area of expertise in a little more detail, first just a small uh, a bit of housekeeping. So initially I'm going to pose a number of questions to our panellists to kick off the discussion and this is going to go for around 20 minutes or so. Then at that point, we're gonna commence the most important part of the webinar. So that's the audience question time. So we ask questions to be submitted via the Q&A feature as opposed to the chat feature as you may have done in the past. So if you could put your questions through the Q&A feature um, and I'll read those out during question time and redirect them to, to particular panelists. So please do feel free to enter questions um, as you think of them throughout you know, the, the webinar and we'll work through those, as I said, during question time. So on that note, I'd now like to invite the panelists to further introduce themselves. So we'll start with Rob Williams. Could you please get us started? Thank you. Ariana, I've turned on my video, that's right. Yep, yes. you wanna see Wonderful. me? Yep. Yes, right. definitely wanna Fantastic. see Fantastic. So uh, I'd also like to acknowledge country and pay my respect to um, uh, where I'm meeting today, where I am today, which is in Kudamundra and the country of Wiradjuri people, uh, and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging, and also pay my respects to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people from uh, across 
across the nation. Uh, so I'm a PhD candidate. I'm at the ANU. I'm uh, uh, currently uh, probably a little too many years into my PhD. Um, but yeah, so my focus is based in southern Vanuatu on a Polynesian outlier uh, and mainly looking at sort of a broad uh, survey uh, settlement pattern history of the island, pre-European history, uh, looking at everything from agricultural terracing, uh, mapping, dating, and those kind of things. I'm also uh, a consultant archaeology, archaeologist in New South Wales um, and uh, work closely with Aboriginal communities and also uh, for my community and my family. I'll leave it there. Wonderful. Thanks, Rob. Um, we'll now go to Kelsey. Thanks, Kelsey. Well, good evening, everyone. Um, I would also like to pay my respects to the elders, both past and present, of the area that I'm working in and residing, which would be the Turbal and Jagera people. As um, Ariana had said, I am a senior research fellow at the University of Queensland, uh, studying the Anthropocene project currently, but I'm also a director of my own little business doing geophysics on the side. My background is primarily geophysics and geoarchaeology. And some of the research interests that I've been working on as of late is incorporating digital technologies into heritage management and archaeology to assist in future research. Um, I'm getting more and more involved in topics such as climate change and sustainable archaeology. So this is something that I hope to kind of work towards changing policies and some of the ideas about how we do archaeology in the future and to make it better so we can continue to do this. But obviously we have a lot of things that are changing in our landscape. So, and that's really kind of all I have to say about that. <laughs> Wonderful, thanks. Thanks, um, Kelsey. We'll go on to Caroline next. Hi everyone, I'm Caroline. I'm talking to you today from Wurundjeri Woiwurrung country in Melbourne, Australia. And I've done a few different things. So I did my PhD in First Peoples Archaeology at Lake Mungo, which was brilliant. And since then, I've worked a little bit in academia. I've worked as a consultant archaeologist. And now I'm working for an Indigenous organisation. So that's the Wurundjeri Woiwurrung Cultural Heritage Aboriginal Corporation. They're the traditional owners, um, custodians of uh, most of the Greater Melbourne area. And I'm also co-chair of National Archaeology Week. Lovely, thank you, Caroline. And, and last but not least, Georgia. Thanks, Ariana. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Dr. Georgia Stannard, and I am also coming to you tonight from Wurundjeri Woiwurrung country near Melbourne um, in uh, Australia. And I would like to pay my respects to elders past and present. Um, so I am a multidisciplinary archeologist and I work across sort of three main areas. Um, the first two of which uh, intersect quite nicely being um, cold climate archaeology, indigenous archaeology of Australia's cold climate areas, and also reconstructing the past environments of those cold climate areas. So I'm currently have a collaborative archaeological research project um, up in the high country around Yurangabili in the New South Wales high country working with Rob actually um, and uh, and I've currently just started a new role which is my third area of interest which is in uh, heritage education um, so I'm, I'm the new um, education and public programs manager for the National Trust of Australia here in Victoria um, and my role here involves uh, developing and implementing public programs and uh, education around heritage and archaeology um, and, and developing in exciting new things for school children right the way through to members of the general public coming and uh, getting excited about heritage, protecting our heritage and uh, getting involved in all the different aspects that we can offer. So that's a little bit about me. Marvellous. Thank you, Georgia. Um, I think, you know, thank you all for, for obviously being here and joining in, um, in this webinar this evening. I think it would be interesting to open the conversation with a discussion of why we do archaeology and perhaps maybe a little bit um, for those that might want to speak to it, how this differs across sectors. So between the private, you know, government universities. Georgia, would you mind um, start sharing your, kicking us off with your thoughts on, on that one? Absolutely. So I think the first thing to, uh, to touch upon when we think about why do we do archaeology is 
for those general members of the public who are joining us this evening, what is archaeology? Um, and this can be a bit confusing. Um, we often find archaeology when we go to barbecues and say, oh, what do you do for a living? We say, I'm an archaeologist. We often get confused with paleontologists, which are people who excavate um, dinosaurs. As archaeologists, we are in fact time travellers who look at human, uh, human uh, material culture from the past. So we look at people's um, material remains that, uh, you know, things that they leave behind in the record that get preserved and then we can investigate those and reconstruct those things to look at people in the past and also the landscapes in which those people lived. Um, so thinking about why is, why is archaeology, why is heritage important? Um, and this is actually quite a difficult question to answer, not because archaeology isn't important, it is, um, but because the outcomes for archaeology are not immediate. Um, we often find that um, archaeology and heritage, while, you know, it's been around for a long time, it doesn't have the immediacy of things like um, legal representation or medical research and so often gets sidelined in these national discussions around STEM and the importance of science. Um, so, you know, I would like to argue that the reason that we do archaeology is not because it's important, but because it's essential, it's critical. So we evolved as social beings and in understanding those social developments, um, how we behave as social animals, how we have adapted to be psychologically social, behaviourally social, emotionally social, is really important in times like the times we are living in now where we are all isolated, not getting in to talk to our friends, our families, our social groups, and understanding how those societies in the past developed, how those connections between people have developed through time um, is really important. And, you know, that's one of the things that we do as archaeologists is investigate people in the past. And one of the really exciting things that we can do is see through the lens of history as well. So history is the written historical record, um, which is often written by people in power. So one of the things that archaeology can really do is see through that, that lens of the historic record, the written historic record, to identify and give agency, give importance to people in the past who didn't fit that definition of power whether that be Indigenous people, um, women, people of um, uh, diversity, um, you know, uh, slavery, all these sorts of um, complex social issues are things that we can investigate through the archaeological record. Um, so that's a bit of an introduction, I guess, from, um, you know, to start us off thinking about this question of why do we do archaeology? And I'd love to hear what my other panellists uh, have to say on that question. Who wants to go? <laughs> the awkward silence. Well, I guess I would agree with you, Georgia, on the social developments there. And I was thinking about the question that I've got to go through next is that, you know, I think really what we do is to, to understand maybe with the directions that we move into the future, it's kind of essential that we have a better understanding of that past. And it's great that we have a profession that allows us to do that, to work with Indigenous communities, to liaise together, to come up with some idea about what we are wanting to do because there's a lot of, we don't know. It's been great that we've had this fortunate ability to understand archeology, span but it's still a really young profession, less than you know a couple hundred years. And it's really evolved from when we first started doing archeology span to people collecting like antiquarians to now working with communities and finding ways to create a more sustainable future in terms of the archeology, span the preservation, and then what we want to do for that future management, because those are the questions we have um, and I guess I'll go more into the next question myself, but is that, you know, we have a growing population. There's these things that are being at risk at play every day as we 
grow and grow in terms of where we want to live, the infrastructure, everything. So what can we do? And our profession allows us to kind of do that. And that's what's the beauty about archaeology. Wonderful. Thanks so much, Kelsey and Georgia. I think for if there's anyone in the audience who isn't currently enrolled in archaeology, I think, you know, they're probably getting on online now and, and, and registering. Um, Rob, I, I see you've unmuted yourself. Did you want to add any thoughts to that before we move on to the next question or Caroline? Um, yeah, sorry, I went to say something before, but I was actually on mute, so apologies. But um, yeah, I don't know. I think I, I was just kind of Going to throw something out there, but you know, I think perhaps why I chose to do archaeology is because it really provided an opportunity for me to reconnect with my culture, with my ancestry, with uh, who I am, my identity, to learn things that were taken from us through colonization. So, um, uh, you know, through the dispossession, through my family's being put up on missions. Um, so, archaeology, which is quite unusual because often archaeology has been sort of um, pigeonholed, and I think we, you know, still believe it is, it is a it is very much about power imbalances. Archaeology still has a long way to go. But um, it's a funny thing that it has allowed me to really have this avenue where I've had a, a career that allows me to reconnect with my family, my stories, my ancestry. And I think that's probably more broadly uh, how uh, other people find archaeology as well. We all have histories. We all have identities. We all would like to find out um, you know, wh why that is important to our own uh, story, to our family stories, to our community stories and society more broadly. So, um, it's a very powerful tool for doing that, and um, it can be quite empowering. And I guess um, just to add to what Rob said, I was thinking about it, this question from a personal perspective. So maybe the reasons why I started doing archaeology and why I'm doing it now are a bit different. So I think in the beginning it was about curiosity, curiosity about um, learning about past civilizations and ancient history. And now having been through all of my studies and worked a lot in First Peoples archaeology, for me, it's more about um, using my skills and expertise to assist Indigenous people with um, investigating aspects of their past that they're interested in to help them learn more and protect their heritage. Um, and more broadly, I guess I'm passionate about um, using information that we learn to share with the broader public to help everybody get a better understanding of ourselves and where we've come from and where we might go in the future. I was just thinking, Ariana. I wanted to add, um, just in terms of why why we do archaeology in a legislative context, might be a useful thing to add in. Um, so there's two sort of areas, I guess, in which we largely do um, archaeology. One of those is research. Um, many of us here today work at a university or have recently been at uni um, doing research. Um, projects. So that sort of blue sky research where we have a research question and we'll go out and secure funding and then go and work with um, stakeholders and community to do answer that research question. The other aspect to why we do archaeology is um, through cultural heritage management works, which when a great example is when we're doing um, uh, you drive around the outer suburbs of any of our major cities, you'll see the sort of spread outwards of, um, you know, the suburbs and new land estates going in, housing estates. Those, um, those, the development of that land needs to then have a, um, a cultural heritage assessment done upon it which will involve um, archaeologists coming and assessing the archaeological potential um, of that area um, in uh, collaboration with uh, traditional custodians for the area if we're focusing on Indigenous archaeology or for um, uh, broader stakeholders of the community if we're focusing on historic archaeology. So those are two broad contexts today in which we do um, archaeology, one for research and one for um, cultural heritage management. Wonderful, thank you. Is everyone, um, does, it, does anyone have anything else to add before I um, move along to the, the next question? Wonderful. I think those are all such, you know, marvellous 
um, responses. And I think that sort of is the beauty of archaeology, isn't it? You know, your your personal background is going to come into it as well. But, you know, you may have had preconceived notions going into archaeology thinking it was going to be one thing. And, and in reality, it, it, you know, may turn out to be something completely different. Um, and it's such a wonderful profession for that reason, because you just never know what you're going to be doing tomorrow, who you're going to be working with, the amazing places you're going to go. So I'm not sure there's too many professions um, that, are, that are quite as dynamic as archaeology can be in that way. Okay, so next question that I have for you all. Uh, so what challenges do we, do we see or what challenges are, are facing archaeology or, or archaeologists moving forwards? And, and I was thinking maybe we'll, I'll throw to Kelsey for, for this one. Um, yes, thanks, Ariana. Well, I think I'm teaching a cultural heritage course now. So part of my work is in research and the other is in heritage management. And this is something I like to talk with students about. And I think what we're seeing now, and I, I touched a little bit light on that in my last answer was that we are seeing a lot of growth in the population of this planet. And therefore you see a lot of infrastructure and development that are taking place. And then we have things like climate change and sea level rise, which are impacting you know, cultural heritage and archeological sites. So one of the things that my colleagues and I did, we put together a response to some of the destruction that's happening in Queensland after a response to the Duke and Gorge, which happened in WA. And it's more about that we have this record of sites that are there, but we really don't have a record of things that have been destroyed, which I think is very um, important when we are thinking about challenges that we face as archeologists and as heritage specialists is that we really don't know the level of destruction, the percentage and the impact. And often when we do heritage management, people are called into that when there's actually an emergency or they find something. So that is one of the challenges that I thought might be potential when I talk to students. I think, okay, in Brisbane, for example, we're going to have the Olympics in 2032. They're estimating a huge growth in population in Southeast Queensland. So on groups like, um, you know, in the Morton Bay region, such as the Quandamooka people, or even, you know, the Cubby Cubby, or people locally, they're all going to be impacted because they're going to have to build this huge infrastructure for, you know, houses, development roads, so forth. And so that's, I see, um, is one of the challenges that we have to face as archaeologists doing our profession is how do we manage that and account and how do we make sure that you know the indigenous people who are living in these areas are being addressed and discussed you know how are these changes being discussed with them and are they okay with that so that's that's something Um, and just to jump in and add to what you said, Kelsey, um, just speaking from a Victorian context and uh, a challenge that we're currently experiencing working for an Indigenous organisation is there's a huge amount of development going on at the moment, especially since COVID. You know, there's a big push on getting construction going, getting the economy going, and a challenging situation for Indigenous organisations at the moment is there are only so many elders. You can't make more elders. You can't make more traditional custodians. So people want to consult with us but we literally don't have enough meeting spaces and we're trying to find solutions to meet all of that. So there's definitely a current development challenge, I think, to meet all of these um, projects that are going on. Yes, I would agree with that. <laughs> and resources and everything else. So it's, it, it is a challenge here, especially not just in Australia, probably globally for that matter. I might um, chime in and um, I don't want to kind of go on this a bit too much because I was hoping to save it for when I get a question thrown at me. But um, I mean, some of the massive challenges are legislation. I mean, they're, they're weak. They're, they're not set up really to even provide any sort of decent protection for heritage. Um, so I think, you know, if we're going to move forward in archaeology, if we're going to try to uh, um, deal with some of these challenges, we need stronger her heritage laws. We need reform. Um, and we need this to be uh, this reform process to be um, ethically and uh, appropriately informed by Aboriginal people as the traditional owners and traditional custodians of Aboriginal cultural heritage in Australia. Um, I won't go in, into a bit more, but you know, it's a bit hard to talk about a positive future for archaeology in Australia unless we're seeing uh, these, these sort of deficits, I think, in policy um, really being um, uh, sorted out. 
sector. Um, and Rob, just quickly, um, I understand there's a bit of a review in New South Wales, of New South Wales legislation at the moment. Do you have any comment on that just while you're talking about that? Yeah, look, I, I'm not, <clears throat> I know the old legislation obviously a bit, a bit better, but I mean, I haven't looked too much into the, the bill, but there was a, there was a great paper that came out in 2021. So is that last year? Yeah, I think it's Lingard et al. Um, and I think they go through different um, aspects of the bill and they really sort of poke holes in what they're sort of proposing. So if anyone's kind of interested in looking at that, I would suggest um, reading that. But in that paper, they set a great standard. You know, the bar should be the United Nations Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous People. Um, and that really places, uh, um, I guess, the, the right for the ownership of Aboriginal cultural heritage back in the hands of Aboriginal people. And I think if, um, we can use that as the bar and if we can move closer to that with any legislation reform then i think you know we're looking at a better future at least from an indigenous perspective um i think another aspect adding on to what rob was just um talking about is um the current um national scale erosion of humanities more broadly um and we are seeing sort of the general commentary around this, um, you know, uh, the, the, the rhetoric around this deepening, apparent deepening divide between science versus humanities in which archeology span straddles these two disciplines. Um, and we've seen, you know, that in how our university courses are being funded and how our research projects are being funded at a national level. Um, and so I think that's a real challenge um, of archaeology moving forward into the future is the story that we are getting at a national level um, is that things like humanities uh, on balance don't matter as much as other disciplines. And as we've already talked about, humanities and archaeology here specifically are really important. Heritage is really important. Um, and, and we need to be getting that somehow out into the broader um, narrative of the general public and making uh, you know taxpayers um, feel like archaeology and heritage are important things that we need to be valuing and promoting in our communities. So I think you know that's a real challenge for archaeologists. Um, I'm sorry about the clicking. My dog is currently eating a cup. Um, <laughs> um, that uh, you know we can be promoting as part of our research projects and our cultural heritage management projects is promoting that heritage to, um, to stakeholders and to the public more broadly. Wonderful. And I think, you know, you've all identified some really prominent challenges that are facing archaeology and archaeologists. And I think probably this is a perfect time then to segue into my next question, which is, you know, how do we see archaeology evolve, evolving? You know, how might we develop or enhance the practice? And I think, you know, Rob, you're, you'd be the perfect person to throw to here to continue on some of those thoughts you were sharing with us on the last question. Yes, uh, thank you. I've got to remember my place. But no, I, I might also just start, I think, from a university in an undergraduate kind of uh, position as well. I'd say for anyone who is uh, currently an undergrad or is thinking about studying archaeology, is trying to sort of like get a good uh, um, variety of courses. You know, I think archaeology and the future of archaeology is interdisciplinary. Um, you know, we, we need to draw upon the, uh, the expertise of geologists, environmental scientists, obviously, is, um, uh, Kelsey's, she's a uh, geophysicists as well as I think it's yeah so um, I mean these things are all extremely useful and particularly in the Australian context where archaeology can sort of be seen as quite challenging um, um, uh, you know uh, other techniques and just uh, uh, that we can use uh, archaeobotanical stuff micro botanical work uh, these are all fantastic ways of really um, developing a, a more clear picture of human history in this continent so yeah, any undergrads? I mean, that was one of the best things that I did was went and did some environmental sciences, some um, geology, and, and they were um, super beneficial for when I actually got out into the field. Um, so that was that. Oops, sorry, excuse me. Um, I would also, I think, get, get back to, I think, you know, I think universities also, I think, need to uh, be a bit more uh, inclusive when it comes to archaeology. I think that's a, that's a you know, there needs to be more um, perhaps trying to attract minorities into the discipline. Um, and this is for um, based on race, gender, um, um, yeah. So uh, demographic, 
age. Um, so I think that's that's a, definitely would be more useful for having a more equitable and, and fair practice in the future. Um, and also, I think that universities need to be doing more to have Aboriginal people in classrooms when we're talking about Aboriginal heritage. I mean, I went through my entire undergraduate, we were doing field schools and we were never given a welcome to country. We weren't given proper acknowledgements by traditional owners because they weren't invited, they weren't in, in, involved in the process. So we were out there marching around people's landscape and um, you know, picking up people's cultural heritage and working with that. And it's completely, you know, it just wasn't the right thing to do. So I know that university is changing and, and I really hope that that is um, um, you know, gonna be sort of more of the future um, is, is having um, a lot more Aboriginal people involved in and teaching in universities. Marvellous. Does anyone have anything else they'd like to, that's a tough act to follow after all, but does anyone have anything else that they want to want to contribute to that question? You know, how, how might we develop or enhance our practice? Um, how do we see archaeology evolving into the future? Any thoughts? Um, I just sort of want to follow follow on a little bit from what Rob was saying in terms of um, our like our teaching practices at um, at uni and more broadly, um, and we are as a as a broader community of practice working um, really strongly on decolonizing archaeology um, and and actively involving um, those discussions into our um, our our courses when we train the next generation of archaeologists. Um, and I think we'll start seeing over the next decade a real um, flow through of those discussions and the, the better incorporation of Indigenous voices into our courses, having guest lectures um, from elders, from community members when we're talking about significant sites around Australia, um, having community Zoom our classes and talk to the students so the students can um, you know, ask questions of elders about the cultural significance of sites, not just about the scientific significance of sites is really important. Um, and one of the, the, the minor benefits of COVID is that these sorts of technologies that allow us to do this are really standard in our teaching practices now. Um, and it's much more commonplace for everyone to be quite comfortable in Zoom and to have Zoom and internet accessible. Um, and I think we're a lot more aware of the capabilities of of having those remote technologies into our teaching practices a lot more. Um, so I think that's a real growth area where the, you know, we can see archaeology moving into the future is enhancing those opportunities. Um, and then, you know, building on those uh, learning opportunities as well within the broader public, having um, those discussions about heritage, um, you know, particularly with the, the panel that we've assembled here, Indigenous heritage and the significance of Indigenous heritage and hearing a range of voices contributing to that discussion, I think in a, a broader um, sense will be really critical to the future trajectory of the discipline. Um, you know, having that equal representation of perspectives in how we value and, um, and, and see the significance in different aspects of heritage. Marvellous. Um, I'm, I'm wary that we might start eating too much into audience question time, but I think we could take another minute or two if there was anything else anyone wanted to add or we can, Kelsey, I see you've unmuted yourself. Were you gonna... I, I just wanted to follow up on what Rob and Georgia said, and I, I agree that, you know, it's, it is evolving in such a way where, um, one, I do like the interdisciplinary nature. I think when I started out, I was taking technical report writing and surveying and soils and all kinds of different courses. And like, you know, fortunately I was in the United States where you can be able to do that, but definitely broadening your discipline makes you much more uh, applicable to using different skills and what you do and thinking and project solving and all of that. But also the incorporation of, you know, all of the other different aspects in terms of, you know, getting those indigenous voices said through what I like to think, to think about is those digital humanities and ways that we can now put this into a, an, an aspect where we can communicate and disseminate information more readily available. So I think that's another aspect of how our future might go. We've got lots of great technology. We can you know, map a whole entire site with an iPad. It's really amazing what we can do. And that can be brought to communities in a way that's more accessible, especially people who can't go to country. So it's it's pretty cool what we can do with technology. 
And just yeah. to add on to that super fast as well. You know, I agree with everyone, everything everyone said, um, Rob, Georgia, Kelsey. And also I just wanted to add that um, talking about digitization, maybe one thing that we can do a bit better in an area that might evolve is sort of looking a bit more broadly. So, and speaking back to what Georgia was talking about before, if there is a bit of a funding crisis, you know, with humanities that versus science, even though it shouldn't necessarily be that way in funding, um, we all perhaps could think about disseminating our research and what we do a little bit more broadly. So um, there are digital techniques at hand to aid with that. There's lots of social media and things like that. Are we writing things in a way that a broader audience can understand and access? A lot of articles that academics publish, for example, are only really accessible to a small proportion of the population. So um, perhaps if people, if we want to evolve as a discipline and get public support and get more funding, we really have to put ourselves out there a little bit as well, um, more publicly and uh, make sure that what we do is well understood and publicly accessible and that anybody can understand it, not just archeologists, not just scientists, not just people who can access journals. Absolutely. And I think it's funny. I think, Caroline and Kelsey, you must be mind readers because you you beautifully allowed a segue into our first um, audience question here. So I think I'm just going to go straight to it. So you and Watson's asked, given that the future is governed by current emerging and new technologies, what is the technological um, so it's the current technological and future state for archaeology. So I guess thinking about the ways that we can use technologies, I think that's the question that's being asked. I hope I'm understanding that correctly. And I feel like, Kelsey, with your geophysics background, that you would be a fabulous person to start start the answer on that one. Um, yeah, so, yeah, thank you. That's a good, it is a good question. Well, my colleagues and I in the computer applications in archaeology are actually putting together a volume on digital technologies, digital storytelling, humanities, geophysics, GIS, remote sensing, drones, everything in a book that's trying to be something type of material that people can use for heritage management in archaeology because we we are now equipped with ways of collecting data. When I started collecting GIS data 20 years ago, it was really laborious, time consuming. And now all I have to do is use a phone and can get all that information. So when we think about the future, I really have no idea because I think in the next five to 10 years, it's even gonna blow our mind. When someone showed me an iPad that could do a 3D model of a building in like five minutes, I was just like, Wow, because you know, five years ago that would have taken you a long time. You'd have to stitch all of those different images together. So I don't know. Like it's it's really exciting to see, and I'm even being blown away by the use of it. I do think it can help us when it comes to policy in the legislation, which Rob pointed out on. I think that's a really good process or thing wave to think forward because we could start to use these resources to help other people use them and then further advance whatever it is that they're interested in doing and managing, um, even doing research. What we do is a destructive process, archeology span essentially, right? So if we can minimize some of those risks or destructions or find a better way of recording it, then this is what I'd hope to see with the technological aspect of it. I might just add to that, that I think um, ground penetrating radar, at least the equipment that's out at this stage is super useful for this purpose. It's being non-destructive, non-invasive. Um, so we've been out the last couple of days running some pretty uh, high-end GPRs, which has been great. It's been a great experience. And obviously I don't really, I'm not a physicist. I don't know much about this, tech, this technology, but I think, you know, even for companies, proponents, it can really save a lot of time in terms of finding where the sites are, where you need to focus your attention. And, and of course, being non-destructive is very useful, I think, for Indigenous people when they're trying to mitigate the impact of um, um, uh, on heritage. So anyway, um, these, 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 I think these should be um, sort of a bit of a, a standard of uh, archaeology going forward, particularly in Australia. And I'll just follow up with that. I think that's great, Rob. I've been working with a lot of communities here in Queensland and advocating the same thing. And even if we don't get the information we want, we're still recording some type of information about that subsurface that can give us some idea of what we can say about that landscape. So big proponent. <laughs>
Absolutely. And I might, and, and you can say no, Caroline, I might, I'm going to throw you in it, but you can say no. I'm one of the editors of the Australian Archaeology Journal and, and Caroline and her team produced a really fabulous paper a few years ago um, looking at an Aboriginal culturally modified tree and did some absolutely fabulous 3D mapping of that tree. And I, if you don't have to, but 30 seconds, you know, if you wanted to tell everyone about that amazing work. Yeah, no worries. So um, that was, oh gosh, 2017. I was working with um, Wiradjuri Elders near Orange. There was a tree that had been found that had a stone tool embedded, or what we thought was a stone tool embedded in what looked to be a scar from bark removal on the tree. Um, and I was asked to help investigate that. Um, so we did all sorts of things. We actually x-rayed the tree, but that didn't make it into the publication, but it was very cool, but very awkward just to see how much further the stone went into the tree and what sort of shape it was. Um, we used 3D modelling, um, so 3D laser photogrammetry, that was Dr Brian Armstrong. Uh, we did radiocarbon dating, we um, spoke to the elders about traditional knowledge. Um, we did, oh yeah, use swear residue analysis of the stone tools. We just threw everything we could at this tree to uh, try and understand how and when the stone came to be in the tree and maybe how it had been used and wrote up an article about it and also published something in the conversation which is freely accessible to people but just thinking about that just the other day I was creating 3D models on my phone so since 2017 and today 2022 you can now just do a lot of this 3D modeling on your phone it's amazing so um, I think that that kind of will make a lot of what we do a bit more accessible if people don't necessarily need the technical expertise to go out and do that kind of thing as well and to be able to share it, you know, with permission from um, elders and communities. Yeah. Absolutely. I might, I know there's so much we can say on this topic, but I, I think we should move on because there are questions coming in and time's going to get away from us. So there's a really lovely question here from Georgia. And George is wondering, how old were you all when you decided to pursue archaeology as a career? And what was your journey to becoming an archaeologist? Georgia, do you want to start? Oh, I'll answer Georgia's question. Um, okay, so I have always had quite an interest in history broadly as a kid. Um, my dad is a maritime historian, so I was always interested in history. Um, and I went, uh, so I did history at high school, ancient history at high school. Um, and I went to an open day at ANU um, and heard the late Professor Colin Groves give a presentation. And it was just the most phenomenal thing I've ever heard. And I was hooked from that point onwards um, and went on to do uh, archeology span and biological anthropology um, at an undergraduate level for my arts degree. And then I did paleoenvironments for a science degree at ANU. Um, yeah, but, and it was, I went in, um, being quite keen on doing um, Scottish and particularly Orcadian archaeology, which is where um, my family um, all come from. And in first year, I volunteered in the lab helping um, Dr. Pat Faulkner do some analysis in his PhD project. And I just became instantly um, fascinated with Indigenous archaeology and I've been in the discipline ever since. Um, so, you know, it was, I, I came at it from a very... Um, young age I guess and then just sort of fell into it um so I did my undergrad just looking at your question again my journey to becoming archaeologist so I did my undergraduate degree which in Australia is three years at uni and then you need to do either an honours year or an, an honours equivalent so you could, could do a graduate diploma or a master's um, to then practice as an archaeologist um, and then went out into industry as a consultant and then came back later to do a master's a PhD so I could teach at uni which is what I love. Um, so I don't know do, do you everyone else want to give sort of their archaeological life history? Well I think Georgia? I, we time is, is limited so we probably can only hear from one more person unless everyone can can sum it up in one sentence and I know Rob, well, I feel like you know Rob started talking a little bit about this in um, introductions so I don't know if you wanted to add a bit more to what you said as well or yeah, why not? Um, yeah, I probably had one of these really sort of, um, I mean, you couldn't, uh, very idyllic, I guess, uh, uh, or, you know, sort of a bit of a 
perfect sort of story to becoming an archaeologist. Um, my dad was the CEO of the Ngunnawal Land Council in Queanbeyan, and so I used to wrangle a day off my parents when I was in primary school to um, go out and do some heritage survey on fire trails or something like that. And I mean, that was probably the best education I could get. You know, I wasn't too much into school, or, you know, I kind of pretty much didn't enjoy my time there. So, um, yeah, so this was, this was um, yeah, when I first really felt like I was um, reconnecting to who I was at this very young age as a young Aboriginal boy, I was still quite aware of it. So, I mean, that was really important. And I can see um, Dave Johnson's on, on the, uh, in part of the participants. So I'll give him a bit of a plug. He was, um, he was very much a, a, a um, uh, He's always been a mentor of my of mine, but um, yeah, I met him when I was first nine on the uh, Eastern Gas Pipeline that he was the uh, head archaeologist on, and uh, always kind of looked up to him. And to see an Aboriginal archaeologist and, and someone who's doing this job, there, there weren't many Aboriginal archaeologists, and they still aren't. So I kind of aspired to be like him one day. Oh, that's a beautiful response. Thanks, Rob. <laughs> um, we might, as much as I would love to hear from you, Kelsey and Caroline, as well. I am looking at the time, and we have a couple of questions left, so we'll we'll move on, and maybe one of you could could start this one off. You know, have you? Well, I definitely know the can't be um, answer for Kelsey. Kelsey has an accent. Have any of you worked or or studied internationally, and what was it like? Um, would Would anyone like to speak to that? Yeah, you go for it, Kelsey. I was just, I guess I can. Um, yeah, hence the accent is I did my undergrad and master's in North America, working with Native American groups in those regions in the northern parts and in the southeastern part of the United States. But I also, after that works, because of my specialty in geophysics and remote sensing, I've gone on projects in South America, studied and lived in Crete for a year, worked in the Mediterranean in um, Greece. Turkey and Cyprus did some work now in Australia all over now through Indonesia, Papua New Guinea. So it depends on what you want to do um, in terms of what you are able to achieve. But I think because of my specialty and not many people do it, I get onto projects a lot. And then in next month, I'm heading to the Caribbean. So first time leaving in three years, Australia on another project. It's very far. I love it. But is probably the farthest place you could pick to go and study and work internationally in uh, this part of the world. <laughs> yes. Amazing. I, I think that's a good tip there for people, Kelsey, you know, get think about what you're going to specialize in and, and, you know, make yourself appealing to others to get involved in their research projects and who knows where you'll, um, where you'll end up. All right. Last of our um, audience questions from Callum. Uh, do you think methodology in theory is keeping pace with the new digital technologies being adopted by archaeologists? So I'll just open that one up. I see Rob nodding. I don't know if that's you're eager to, to go for it. Oh, that, I'm sorry, nodding it. That was a great question. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't know if I have an answer for it. So yeah, I'll let someone else be more experienced go first. I think. Does so anyone like to have a go at that one? Caroline, I see you've unmuted yourself. Oh, I was just going to, you know, throw the discussion, start the discussion by saying, um, yeah, technology just seems to move so fast, as with social media, faster than everything else can keep up with, I guess. What does everyone else think? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, and your example from before was, you know, is, is demonstrating that, you know, the... The technologies that we need to get across, let alone best practice in terms of methodologies and collaboration, it's it's it feels often exponential. You know, you you go through a global pandemic and you pop out the other side ready to pick up again, and all of a sudden there's 600 new techniques that you can apply to things. Um, yeah, and so I mean, and the diversity. I think something to bring to that question, which is an awesome question, by the way, as Rob said, is the diversity of things you can do in archaeology. So archaeology is not just about excavation. You know, you can focus on pollen analysis. You can focus on insects in the archaeological record. You can focus on metallurgy. You can focus on like literally anything you can think of that is currently a passion of yours, if you want to apply it to the archaeological record for people in the past, archaeology is the discipline for you. So anything you do now that you like, if you like it in the past, become an archaeologist. Yeah, I think um, theory has been left behind a little bit. Um, I mean, it's not so much a focus in undergraduates or university um, degrees anymore uh, in archaeology. So I think that's a, a shortfall. I think it can be very useful. 
Um, uh, but I also was going to say that I think with the new technologies and stuff, there are issues around intellectual property with the amount of data that's being accumulated, where it's being stored, how's it being shared, is it giving access to the wrong people who aren't meant to have that sort of cultural knowledge or, or these kind of things. So um, I think ethically, there's, uh, there's probably a lot of work that needs to be done around um, yeah, the amount of data that's being accumulated around digital models of artifacts and all these sorts of things. So um, definitely a space to keep, keep working on. Absolutely. And I think, um, you know, I might need to stop the, the responses right here just because of the time. But I, I just did want to say, you know, thank you, everyone, for those um, excellent questions. They sparked some really great discussion. Um, and I think, you know, just to obviously bring everything to a close, the final question I wanted to pose to the panellists um, is to ask them to consider um, and ask, I guess, you know, looking to the future. Um, you know, if they can give us their thoughts on how archaeology could potentially contribute to a better future. Um, and I think, Kelsey, maybe, would you be happy to, to start that one off for us? Sure. Um, I really think a lot of what we discussed in this seminar has covered a lot of those aspects. I had things written down, but I, I feel that we've covered a lot of it. You know, I have things like maybe using the past to help manage a better and sustainable future, which we've talked about, the use of digital um, technologies and humanities, but the digital ethics around that aspect, um, using those to help inform policy legislation, which we all know needs a bit of improving, we need a little bit more um, reform, those sort of things. And then creating more opportunities for indigenous people to make you know, management decisions. I think that was an area where we saw some shortcomings, but the change in the New South Wales and Queensland legislation are looking towards more getting input from First Nations group. And we're certainly seeing this happening in Canada and now in some parts of the United States. And I think it's great when you think about getting these voices in the say about what our future can be, because we have to all work together. We have that all that shared cultural history, right, and invested interest. So if we can work together and be on the same page and work towards whatever we can do to make it more sustainable, that would be fantastic. So that's my two cents. <laughs> I think you largely covered it, Kelsey, you know, development of best practice methodologies, making sure that we're being rigorous in our approach, inclusive in our approach, um, making sure we have a diverse cohort of up and coming archaeologists from a range of different um, social backgrounds, economic backgrounds, racial backgrounds. Um, yeah, all that diversity really promotes, um, you know, sustainability into the future. Yeah, and um, taking a step back, I wrote something down. So I think just having a better understanding of ourselves and of our past and deep history and what's happened over the course of tens, hundreds, thousands, millions of years is very good for promoting better understanding of ourselves and each other through our past and present and future and for giving a sense of perspective. I think it's really important that everybody has that sense of perspective and it kind of helps us relate to each other as well and um, look to the future. Wonderful. Uh, so I was thinking, we have five minutes left and I'm, I'm thinking I am gonna throw Caroline's bonus question at you all, probably to your horror, but I will, I'll go first maybe to be, to be generous. So that, that final question is, describe the future of archeology span in five words. Um, very easy to do. So I had to think about this and I thought um, archaeological research centred on Indigenous partnerships, technically six words, but as the convener, I'll, I'll allow it for myself. <laughs> Would anyone else like to go and, and, and have their say? The future of archaeology in five words. Yeah, so my five words um, are collaborative, inclusive, digital, open access and that was only four so I added fun at the end too. Someone else want to go Rob? I was going to say it's very important it has to be fun I mean we'll get a bit bored otherwise but um yeah look uh, I think uh, I was going to say respect ask first uh, ethics and ethics yeah they're my five. <laughs> 
I don't have really any new words <laughs> to contribute to our five words. I mean, I think we're kind of reaching consensus. Maybe yeah. education, George. Education. Education. Yes. education times five. Education, yes. I mean, inclusivity, collabor collaboration, um, education would be definitely in my, in my top. But, you know, I would second all of these keywords that we have just discussed. Yes. Marvellous. Well, thank you all for those excellent responses. Um, and I think you know, it's clear really that the future of archaeology in Australia is going to be dynamic, community driven and collaborative um, as we really look to the past to, to move forwards into the future, I suppose, maybe just to kind of summarise everything you've all been saying. But unfortunately, we are out of time um, and it is now uh, time to close the webinar. So my sincere thanks uh, to our panellists. Thank you very much, Rob and Kelsey and Caroline and Georgia. You are absolutely fantastic. Of course, to the audience for joining us and all of your wonderful um, questions. I think we could have gone on for another hour quite easily. Um, and also uh, to the Australian Archaeological Association who are partners on this particular webinar. So while this is the end of our webinar, uh, this, is the only, this is only the beginning of an exciting week of, activity, of activities and webinars uh, for National Archaeology Week. And Caroline has kindly put them, the, the um, upcoming seminars on the slide for you there. So we hope to see you again at some of these during the week. Um, plenty of exciting things still to come and for you all to get involved in. Otherwise, that's all from all of us. Thank you so much. Um, thanks, everyone, for joining us and, and good night.